Welcome to the Bubble Beginners Workshop, Part 1, presented by NoCodify.com. In Part 1, we are going to discuss overall Bubble.io, and then we'll dive into the Bubble Editor, App Organization, Database Design, and then we'll finish off with Workflows. Now, before we dive into Bubble itself, we just want to go over a couple slides just to get yourself acquainted with this workshop. So briefly, we just want to discuss who we are and what we do. Um, we are a business, nocodify.com. We teach how to build web apps, and we exclusively teach Bubble. This is because we are firm believers that Bubble is the best no-code platform today. It's the most complex and the most advanced, which is why we're only sticking to Bubble at this point in time. We're always doing research on other no-code platforms, but today, in this market, we believe that Bubble is the best and the one that you should be using for your no-code app development. So just a couple things that we do. We have guided tutorials just for any specific use cases that you may have. We're always uploading more tutorials and more courses into our website. Next, we also offer one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, these are great if you have specific pain points within your app, if you just want to learn from a Bubble professional, um, it's just a really good way for you to interact with someone who knows Bubble really well and for you to quickly learn and get over that Bubble learning curve. We also have a business builder program in which we literally work with you one-on-one -on -one to build your business and your web app from the ground up, okay? We start all the way from ideation or if you have your Bubble idea and you just want to start building it out, we will work with you from the start all the way to launching your web app. We also offer offer office hours once a week. Um, we'll probably increase that to two or three times a week. And then also we're, you know, we are a no code platform, right? Like we teach no code, so our website is built on no code. So we're always bringing more and more features, more and more content into our website every single day, every single week. So um, just stay tuned. We'll be offering more things in the coming future. We just want to plug a real quick plan. We are offering 50% off our lifetime plan. If you're interested, just email us at info at nocodify.com. Um, now is a really great time to go ahead and start building a web app, right? I mean, if you're just watching this workshop right now, you are literally 99% ahead of everyone else, right? Because not many people have learned about what no code is. It just means that you're ahead of the curve. You're there before everyone else. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with the workshop. So just some quick details for this workshop. 39 people RSVP'd. And then within that, 49% of you said that you've never tried Bubble, which is really great, right? Because you're interested in something that is really cool, it's really new, right? Bubble's only been around for four or five years now. It's pretty new, um, and we are firm believers that within five to 10 years, no code will be kind of the mainstream development method. 46% of you said you've n tried Bubble briefly within you know one to two weeks or so, but you're still pretty new to it. So just by looking at these numbers, we're gonna go ahead and tailor these workshops to people that you know, are fairly new to Bubble. So if we go slow, we apologize in advance. We just want to make sure that everyone understands the content that we provide in these workshops. So what is Bubble.io? Like we said, we believe that it's the most powerful no-code platform, okay? The amount of customization and flexibility that it offers if we went ahead and asked 10 people to build the same web app, let's say Airbnb, we would definitely get about 10 different Airbnb web apps, okay? Just because there are a thousand different ways to go ahead and build the same web app. So it's, it's really powerful and it's the one that we recommend for anyone to build a fully functional web app and an MVP. Bubble is also dynamic, meaning that you know, based on conditions and extern extra externalities, you can make your website dynamic, right? For one user, your web app can look this certain way, and then for another user, it can look a different way, okay? Now, this is very much so different from 
other, let's say, no-code website builders such as Squarespace, Wix, and Weebly because those are really good for static web pages, okay? Static landing pages. It's most likely going to look the same for, you know, every single person that happens onto your website. But with Bubble, you can build certain conditions where it's different for any sort of different user in your application. Now, Bubble also has an in-house relational database for every single application that you build on it. Okay, this is really great because you don't need to focus on, you know, building a database somewhere outside of Bubble, um, integrating it with your application, scaling the database, and everything that's required with just starting up a database. It's it's really nice. Now, with that said, you don't have to use the Bubble database. You can use something like Amazon Web Services and then use the API connector to kind of, you know, send things off to the database or retrieve things. But for most use cases, about 99% of people, we just recommend sticking with the Bubble in-house database. And then lastly, there are plugins, okay? So if you know, the item or feature that you want isn't provided by Bubble off the shelf. There are third party developers on Bubble that, you know, have created plugins, uh, for example, payment processing, um, live chat. You know, there's so many plugins. Last time we checked, there are over 750 or 800 or so plugins created that you can just go ahead and quickly install them into your application. So let's go ahead and move on. Now we get this question time and time again, so we just want to go over this briefly, okay? Many people ask us, you know, Bubble or Webflow, which is better, which one should I be using? So briefly, let's just go over that. Now, with anyone that uses Webflow, okay, the popular Webflow stack is Webflow itself, integrated with member stack, integrated with Zapier, and then lastly, also integrated with Airtable, okay? Let's say, again, the same example that you're building Airbnb, okay? You'll have, obviously, the website. You'll have, you know, membership, because you, people can create accounts. Some web pages are only limited to people that are logged in, okay? So then now you'll need member stack to kind of be able to accommodate those logged in users. Maybe if you have a paywall in your application, you again, you'll need member stack. For Zapier, you know, you'll want to integrate a database in your web app, so you need something that's sending, that's retrieving things from the database as well as sending things to the database. And then lastly, you need Airtable because you need, an, you need a database, right? So you have four different tools for your no-code app. Whereas for Bubble, all you need is Bubble, right? You can use Webflow for the landing page and then Bubble for your actual application. But if you just take the time to learn Bubble, you can knock off all the other three different no-code tools that you might need for Webflow, okay? Now, we give credit to Webflow. They are really good, way better than Bubble in marketing, right? So that's why so many more people have heard of Webflow. And so many people have tried Webflow more so than Bubble. But again, if you're building a complex web app, then Bubble really is the way to go. Okay. And look, we're obviously biased. So, you know, we teach Bubble, we prefer Bubble. So we're definitely going to lean towards Bubble. Um, but if you use Webflow, that's completely okay. Um, but hopefully in this webinar, you'll get a better sense of bubble itself and you'll be able to make a more informed decision as to what you can do. And then lastly, the last slide we want to go over before we kind of go into bubble and take a dive into bubble um, are some comments that we received from you when you were RSVPing. Okay, the first comment being there seems to be a gap of users wanting to do something in bubble and the bubble way of doing things. Okay, so Thank you very much for this comment. We have taken that into account when we go ahead and teach um, these two workshops. Um, like we said very on in the start of this workshop, if we gave the kind of like a lesson to build an Airbnb app for 10 people, they would all go ahead and build it differently, right? With the database structure, with the workflows, etc. So while there is a you know, better ways, best practices to build a bubble application. There isn't one 
you know, perfect way. Okay, there there are just general good practices. So we'll go ahead and hit on some of them. Um, but again, don't be too concerned with building your application the right way. You just want to go ahead and make sure that you're building it, you know, with good practices for speed, performance, and organization. Okay, the next comment is focusing on how to go from a Figma template to a bubble app. So currently, as of March 2020, there is no way for you to design your web app in a design kind of platform such as Figma or Adobe um, and then easily import it into Bubble, okay? There is a third-party developer trying to make a plugin for Figma, um, but as of now, there is no way for you to just quickly import your designs into Bubble. Um, so one thing that we recommend is for you to either have your app mockup you know, through Figma or just on pen and paper. And then you just look at that while you're designing your application on Bubble itself. But unfortunately today, there is no way to just import a template. Okay, next is I wanna mix a usage of Bubble with other apps. So this is a little more advanced and we probably won't get to it in these two workshops, um, but there definitely is a way, okay? If you're interested, you can go on the Bubble form and look up iframes. That's how you go ahead and integrate Bubble with other web apps. So on your WordPress website, you can just add an iframe, okay? And then it would link to Bubble and you can kind of run that Bubble application through webs through WordPress. But unfortunately, it's just too complex and advanced for this kind of beginner's workshop. Next is the example of live sites. So we'll think about this for the next workshop. Oh, sorry, the next workshop. But um, if you're interested in looking at live sites, you can go on our website, nocodify.com. That's built completely on Bubble. Um, or you can just go ahead and go on the Bubble form, okay? There's a category called Showcase. And within that showcase ca category, you can just see people posting, hey, check out my website, we just launched, et cetera, et cetera. So you can get a good idea of some example sites that have been built on Bubble. Okay, and the last question, maybe do it from a mobile first perspective. Now this is great, um, but unfortunately for this workshop, we do want to focus on a desktop first, just because it's a web app and you know if we were limiting it only to mobile first, then we wouldn't get the full scope of Bubble. Um, and then with that said as well, we just want to let you guys know that it's still on Bubble's roadmap, but you cannot build a mobile app on Bubble and then quickly and easily import it and export it to the you know Google Play Store or the iOS Store. Um, you can go ahead and build a mobile app on Bubble, and then you can wrap it in a wrapper and then then go ahead and export it into iOS and the Google Play Store but Bubble doesn't give you a seamless transition you there are a couple extra steps they're not hard for sure they're not hard but you know Bubble doesn't offer that okay you're gonna have to go to some third-party websites to go ahead and create your Bubble uh, mobile app okay so with that said there's these are just some comments we wanted to highlight we got a couple more but um, you know, a lot of them were just nice compliments, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just ones that we wanted to focus on. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and just dive into Bubble. So here we have a brand new Bubble editor. Okay, this is just a brand new application we created. Everything is blank. There's nothing in this application. So when you go ahead and you first create your Bubble application, you'll be shown this page right here, the Bubble Editor, okay? Everything blank, no elements, nothing. Okay, so let's go ahead and just give you a broad overview of the Bubble Editor, okay? So from the outside looking in, you'll see that there are seven tabs right here on the left side, okay? Design, workflow, data, all the way down to logs. So let's just go ahead and briefly cover what each one of these tabs are, okay? So the one that's currently highlighted is the design tab, okay? This is the one that you see here, okay? This is how you're going to build the front end and the UI of your application, okay? Obviously, like the name says, this will be the way that you design your web app, okay? From all of the elements and all of the UI. 
Next, we have the workflow tab. This is how you're going to go ahead and build out all of the workflows. Okay, so when the user presses this button, do this. When this condition is true, do this. Okay, so this is where you'll be building all of the logic into your bubble application. Next, we have the data tab. Now, this is the in house bubble database. Okay, this is where you'll be building out the database, where you'll be setting the privacy rules for your database, which we'll cover in part two. And then lastly, where you can see all of your application data. Okay, and we'll go into that a little bit more um, in depth throughout this workshop. Next, we have the styles tab. Now, here is where you'll set um, reusable styles. Okay, so say, you know, as you see here, alert, caution, light. Um, if you're going to be using some kind of element, right? For example, here we have alerts, here we have buttons, drop downs, images, inputs. So if you have certain elements that you're going to be using throughout your application many times, then you'll want to use styles, right? Because you'll just save yourself more time. Um, so you don't have to design each single element. Instead, you can just quickly select the style for that element and then it'll use that style. Okay, next we have the plugins tab. So again, as we were saying earlier, if it's not provided off the shelf by Bubble, you can just go ahead and look through the list of plugins that you know are in the Bubble plugin store um, and just quickly install one, okay? For example, if you want to process payments in your application, which we will cover in part two, you will need to install a plugin for that, okay? So if you are looking for something that is not provided by Bubble, just go ahead and look in the plugin store. Now with that said, um, the store has plugins that are created by Bubble and then also by third-party developers. Okay, so there are a mix of free and then also paid plugins, okay? So some plugins are completely free while others you might have to pay monthly, you might pay just for a one-time use um, or subscribe to their their plans, right? It's a developer store, so the developers set their prices. Next we have the settings tab. Now here's the general settings for your application, okay? The application plan, any sort of general settings, the domain, SEO, okay, et cetera, et cetera. So, just take a look through the settings. It's pretty self-explanatory, um, but these are just your general application-wide settings. And then lastly, we have the logs tab. Now here is where you'll be able to see reports for your application, okay? How um, is it hitting the max capacity, right? So say you have 100 users on your application at once, you'll be able to quickly see how the performance is with your application. One thing we do want to note um, within, sorry, it's within settings or no, it's within the application plan, okay, is this capacity temporary boost, okay? When you're launching your application, and let's say you're going to go ahead and post on Reddit, on Product Hunt, on Twitter, on Facebook, right? So you are expecting, you know, hundreds if not thousands of users to just all be on your application on the same day, maybe even on the same time. You'll want to go ahead and give your application a temporary boost, right? What this does is it increases the bandwidth of the amount of workflows that can be run concurrently on your application, right? So say you have a hundred users and they're all kind of doing the same thing. Let's say they do some workflow where, you know, it needs to add new things into your database and do all sorts of different workflows, okay? So if there are many, many users on your application all, uh, all having to do workflows at the same time, it's going to slow your application down. So if you're expecting many users on your application at once, you'll just want to go ahead and boost your application, okay? And you get three times per month free. Um, and then you can go ahead and just buy a higher plan if you need more. Okay, so with that said, that's all of the tabs. Um, so let's get into the bubble header, the top kind of area right here, okay, the header bar. 
So here we see page index. Now, if you know traditional you know, development, you understand what an index page is. But if you don't, we'll just cover that really quickly. In traditional development, the page that your users come to first is your index.html page. OK, so generally speaking, this page will be your landing page, right? So if your users type yourdomain.com, they will come to this page first, okay? So generally speaking, the index page should be your landing page. Okay, so here in this white space, you're going to be adding things to your index page, okay? But say we wanted to create another page, right? Let's go ahead and we'll click this drop down, and we see all of the pages that Bubble gives us by default. And if we want to add a new page, we would just click this button here. We would give it a name, and then we would press create, right? And then the page would be created and added to this list. And if we want to go ahead and edit that page, we would just click it, and it would load it, and we can start editing it, okay? So this blank space is always the, the page that's provided right here that you're editing. Okay, now this drop down here on the right of it, are the elements within that page. Okay, you see that we have none so far, but if we go to the visual elements area and drag in text, now we can click this drop down and see that we have text. Okay, also you can see it, sorry, we'll drag it back in. You can also see this in the elements tree right here, okay, that we have text A. Next, we have this edit button, and here we can undo, redo. Um, you can copy and paste and do all of these fancy sort of editing tasks, and we'll go more into detail with them a little later. Next, we have the help section, which is just some quick tutorials provided by Bubble, as well as some other properties, manuals, and forum, and reporting bugs. So again, it's just kind of a help tab. Then we have this gift box right here. Now this is Bubble's way of telling you if there are new features added. So if you come here every day, most likely you'll see this button kind of grayed out. But on days where they release new features or new announcements, this button will be kind of highlighted in yellow or red, meaning you know there's a new feature out. Okay, in grids and borders, this is just a way for you to, you know, have your way of being able to design your application, right? So if you like to see a grid, you can press the show grid, and now you see in the back a grid, so you'll be able to space your elements more easily. Okay, so this grids and borders tab right here is just a way for you to kind of personalize your um, design experience. So if you like some of these options, go ahead and use them. If not, don't use them. Next, we have this Arrange button here. So these are just ways, again, like the, where it says, to arrange your designs, OK? Um, bring to front, send to back, you know, centering your elements, aligning them, distributing them. You know, anything to do with arranging your, your UI elements would be in this tab right here. OK, we have an Undo and a Redo button. And then we want to get to these two right here. So obviously pressing preview, it'll load your application in a preview format and you'll be able to test it out. And then here you can see that you're in your development um, kind of environment, right? And if you want to go ahead and deploy your application, okay? So say you've built out your application, you're ready to deploy. You'll click it right here and press deploy current version to, to live, okay? Now, one thing to note, a couple things to note here, is that when you're deploying your current version to live, you are deploying any sort of changes that you've made since the last time you've deployed it, okay? So let's say I my current version is deployed, but now I've added this text here, and I've added this text here. If I go ahead and deploy current version to live, now the users will see these two new text fields, okay? So just you know, word of note that whenever you deploy, you're deploying every change that you have, okay? So you, as you have 
many um, versions in your application, when you're making changes, you'll probably want to note them down just so you remember what you have, you know, the changes that you've made in your application. Okay, and lastly, we have this create save point. Now, this is kind of Bubbles version of GitHub, okay, having different versions of your application, different save points. Okay, now this is only offered on the highest bubble plans, okay? It's not offered on the hobby plan, which is the free plan, and it's not offered on the personal plan, which is the next step up. Um, it's a very useful tool, but again, you have to pay a higher tier for this. So if you're building your application by yourself, then you probably don't need it. Um, but if you are working with a large development team and, you know, on a successful growing business, you probably will need this versioning GitHub kind of bubble style. Okay. So that's it for the header area and the left tab. So now we can go ahead and kind of dive into bubble. Okay. So let's get started with the design tab itself. Okay. The front end UI tab. So here we see that we are on the UI builder, right? As the name says, this is exactly how we'll go ahead and build out our bubble application, okay? All of the front end, everything that the users can see, okay? Here we have the responsive tab. Now this is how you'll go ahead and make all the settings for your application to be responsive, okay? So how your application will look like on a desktop, versus an iPad versus a mobile phone. Okay, so all of the responsive settings are here in the responsive tab. Okay, but we'll stick to the UI builder for now. So here we see a couple different groupings, okay? And we'll start with the top, the visual elements. These are all of the elements that you can add into your bubble application, right? So we see here dragging in a text field or we can drag in a button, right? So we see all of these off-the-shelf kind of visual elements, but we see also an install more button, okay? So again, like we said, you'll want to take advantage of the plugins offered by Bubble because there are just so many, right? So if these visual elements just don't cut it for you, you can go ahead and install hundreds of more, okay? And most applications tend to install more just because this is you know, just by default, a pretty small amount of visual elements. Okay, next we have containers. Okay, and like the name suggests, these contain elements within them. Okay, so for example, let's go ahead and add a text and a button. And we see here in our elements tree that we have two elements. Okay, right, the things that we just added, the text A and the button A. Okay. Now, if we went ahead and added, let's say, for a standard kind of web page, there could be hundreds, you know, about a hundred or so elements. Various texts, various buttons, icons, links, images, etc., etc. This elements tree would get pretty long, right? Um, so we tend to suggest, highly suggest, that you use groups, okay? And they're nothing but ways to kind of group your elements together in ways that are appropriate and that make sense, okay? So here we see group A, and then if we just drag in the button and drag in the text where you can see that the red is now being highlighted, meaning we're dragging this text element into the group. Once we let go, now we see that group A is the only item in the element tree. If we expand it, now we see the text and the button. Okay, so it's a lot easier now to go ahead and work with this versus just having many, many rows of elements that aren't grouped together. Right, so if we saw, see this group A and we, you know, titled it sign up form something, right? Now we see that the group sign up form, and we'll open this up. Right, and we see all of the elements that are in within that sign up form. So it's a lot easier. And then you can go ahead and drag around your group, and it's much, much more easier to design. Now, another advantage of using groups is the fact that soon enough, you'll be building responsive settings to your application. 
Now we don't want to get ahead of ourselves here, but let's just take it for one example here. Let's say that we never want this sign up form, this group, to ever expand, right? Or contract based on the responsiveness of the you know the user's device, right? Based on the size of the user's device. So we see here in the group settings, make this element fixed width. If we check that now, whenever a user is you know on this website, on this web page, and sees this sign up form, depending on their screen size, this will never change. Okay, if they're on a desktop, it'll always be 421 pixels in width and 250 pixels in height. Okay, this would be on a on a PC, on an iPad, or a mobile device. Okay. Now if you uncheck this, then this will start, you know, getting bigger or getting smaller. Now it almost never gets bigger. Um, I would say only for certain elements do they get bigger. Okay. Um, like images, for example, but groups and texts and buttons don't get bigger. They'll only get smaller if need be. Okay, so again, with groups, you'll want to go ahead and group your elements where it makes sense to. Okay, really quickly, one good example of grouping elements together is let's say we have a hero section on our landing page. Okay, so this would be something like the header or, you know, the, the first text the user sees when they get to the page and then your call to action like, you know, purchase this product, sign up, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the group would be group hero. Okay, and then you would create a group below it that has, you know, group, I don't know, more information, whatever you have below this hero. Okay, so that's groups. Next within containers, we have repeating groups. Now, we will get to this um, when we're talking about database design, um, but it's probably the most complex visual element to take to grasp, okay? So fair warning, um, but this is also, with that said, the most powerful visual element that you can have in Bubble. So let's go back and I think we'll just go ahead and use Airbnb for every example that we have just because everyone knows Airbnb. Um, so when you're on the Airbnb website, you know, it's, it's a listings for rentals basically, right? Um, so when you're scrolling on Airbnb, you'll see rows of rental listings, right? That you can rent out, houses that you can rent out for a fixed period of time. Okay, so the way that you can replicate that in Bubble is by using a repeating group, okay? So every, let's say, listing of a rental home would have its own row, okay? Its own row. So when we get to database design, we'll talk about how to populate this repeating group. But we see here in the repeating group settings, the type of content, right, would be a listing, okay? A listing. And then, then each row would be a separate listing. Okay, so that's what repeating groups are. They're a way, they are groups where they search for a specific data type within your database, and then they present each data type or each object of that data type within each row. Okay, and you know, Abstract level, it's a little hard to understand, but once you see an example, you'll understand it more clearly, okay? Next, we have pop-ups, very self-explanatory. You would just drag it in, right? And then we have a pop-up, and based on certain workflows and conditions, you can go ahead and show this pop-up. Then we have floating groups. Now, these are, you know, as the name suggests, they float. So if we added this floating group to the top, right, and now on our settings we have vertically float relative to top, when the user scrolls up and down, right, now here this is the editor so this won't stay sticky, but when we preview it, this floating group will always be at the top of the web page, okay? So one great example of using a floating group would be a header, right, for your landing page or even on your other pages that you want always stickied to the top. 
So even if the user scrolls up and down, you always want something floating and stickied at the top of the web page. Okay, so you'd use a floating group for that. And then lastly, we have group focus. Now this is how you keep submenus in your application. This is how you build submenus, okay? So we'll drag it in and you'll understand once we have it showing. Okay, so the group focus always needs a reference element, right? Because it needs to know kind of where it should be relative to the page. Okay, so we'll have text A as its reference element. And now we see that this group focus is right below the text element. Now we can offset it, right? We can say from the top, we want it 20 down. Okay, so it'll always be 20 pixels from the bottom of this text A element. Okay, and then we can also do it left or right. Okay, and offset top, we can do minus 20, and it would be 20 pixels from the bottom up. Okay, this is how you build submenus, right? So if you have some kind of text that says, you know, more options, okay, and let's say they click that text, then this submenu would show and you can have various options within that. Okay, so that's a group focus. Okay, and lastly, we have input forms. Now these, we're not gonna go into too much detail, but they're very self-explanatory, okay? This is how your users are going to provide information for your application, right? A simple input, right? Anything that a user can type out, okay? You have multi-line, you have check boxes, drop down, search boxes, radio buttons, et cetera, et cetera. And then again, you can always install more through the plugin store. Okay, so that's it for the visual elements, the containers, and the input forms. Now the last thing we wanna go over for this design tab here are reusable elements. And we brought them up really quickly earlier, but we just wanna emphasize them again, okay? So one popular thing that you would be a reusable element is a sign up or login, you know, pop up or form, right? So if you have multiple pages, right, that the users can see, and then you have a button that says sign up slash login, you don't want to build out five or six of, you know, different but the same login and sign up pop ups, right? You just want one. Okay, so you see here under reusable elements, these are elements that you created one time that you can now just drag them in on any page and they'll function the same way. Okay, so to create reusable elements, you would click on this drop down right here where it says page index and you would click add a new reusable element. Okay, and then you can create whatever you'd like. But let's just go into this sign up login pop up. Okay, and this is the default bubble sign up login pop-up. It's ugly, right? It's, it's just what bubble came up with, but you can obviously change it or you can delete it and create your own. Um, but the way this functions is that you're building it kind of like its own, let's say, page, right? So it'll have all of the elements, all of the inputs, groups, containers, its own buttons, and then its own workflows, okay? That's the most important. It has its own workflows, okay? Now this is getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but we just wanna show you what we mean by that. So when the user presses sign up, right, we can go into the workflow tab, and we see here button sign up is clicked with the workflows associated with that button, okay? So for your reusable elements, you can only uh, build the workflows within those reusable elements, okay? When you go back to your index page, and you add this sign up login pop up, okay? You see here in the settings window, there's no nothing here that has start edit workflow, right? When you add in a text element, you see that there's a start edit workflow, okay? Because this text field is relevant to this page only, okay? But if you have a reusable element, right? Such as this sign up login pop up, you cannot create workflows by this pop-up, right? You would have to edit the workflows on the actual sign up login uh, reusable element page. Okay, so just word of caution there. Okay, so that's how to go ahead and look at and use reusable elements.
Um, and then also, right, you can go ahead and build reusable elements on this page, right, on this, on any page really, and then you can transfer it to be a reusable element. So you don't have to go ahead and click add, re add a new re reusable element here. You can build out a group, right, you would start with a group, and then you would add whatever visual elements and workflows, and then you can change it into a reusable element. Okay, but again, you can only edit the reusable elements from here, right, with all of their associated workflows. Okay, so you'd want to use a reusable element wherever you have some kind of process that, you know, it's taken place in more than one area of your application, right? The, the most obvious would be the sign up and login, but there are definitely different forms that you might have throughout your application that you don't want to build them out independently. You just want to build it out one time. Okay, the last two things we want to cover for the design tab are the settings, okay? So for any element, for any container, for any input, you have settings, okay? So by clicking text A, we have this settings kind of pop-up open up with all of these different settings, okay? We have a style associated, which we'll just cover in one minute, but if we remove the style, now we can go ahead and give it its properties for the actual text, okay? And there are these, all of these different settings that um, are pretty obvious, so you should just go ahead and play around with them, and you'll quickly be able to learn them. Um, but again, each visual element has its own settings, okay? So we can give text A its own settings, right? Its own settings. But then we can give group A its own settings, right? It has its own settings with the background style, right? We can change it to be black or gray. And if we drag text A into group A, right, we can still give text A its own, you know, settings, right? We can now make the font white. And then we can go in group A and give its own settings as well, right? So each setting is, you know, appropriate and relevant to whatever element it's, you know, assigned to basically, right? So here you're editing text A settings while here you're editing group A settings. Okay, so for any visual element, you have its own settings. Okay, and then lastly, pages also have their own settings, independent pages. So here we are in the blank bubble editor. If we just double click, we see we're editing indexes settings, right, which is our page name. Okay, so whenever you see your page name here, that means you're editing that page. So here for page title, it says browser bar, right? Meaning that, um, you know, right here you see no codify tutorials. This page title is whatever is displayed on the browser bar. Okay, that's why we have that there. Okay, um, this was from a previous tutorial. So if you have a separate page that is dedicated to being the mobile version, okay, you can always go ahead and build your pages um, responsive settings so that one page can work towards being a you know the the default page for a mobile viewing or you can create a separate page that functions only as the mobile version okay so you would define that here okay so the mobile version of this index landing page would be index mobile so whenever the user hits this page and the and bubble recognizes that it's a mobile device, it'll send them over to the index mobile page. Okay. Next we have type of content, which means that you're assigning your page to be a specific data type, a specific object for a data type. Okay. One example again with the Airbnb is that when you click a rental listing right from the search area it'll open up a separate tab that displays just that listing within that tab right it'll have the title of the house pictures of the house you know the pricing everything that has to do with that one listing so let's say you have a page where you just want to show one listing so the type of content would be a listing 
okay we haven't done database design yet that's why we don't have listing here but if you just want to show one thing right if you want your page to be dynamic where the user clicks something it loads a page that shows that one thing from the database you would set this page that type of content to be that data type okay and we'll show you that in a little bit okay so these are the page settings okay you can change your width and your height um, and if you don't want your page to be responsive you would go ahead and say that make this element fixed width meaning that if your browser if the user's browser ever gets smaller or bigger it doesn't matter your page will be static it will not be responsive okay and lastly we have the SEO settings for a page this is something many people skip um, but it's extremely important right so for every page in your bubble application you want to go ahead and have a title description an image for you know that page just because if someone shares that URL on a social media on a website anything that you know has a thumbnail associated with it um, you want to make sure that you have the proper title and description for that page right the proper image okay lastly we have the page HTML header so if you have any sort of JavaScript um, that you want to run or CSS anything really um, you can add that here to the page HTML header now this is different from the settings right in settings if I can close out of this index um, you can have and I need to find it I believe it's on SEO meta tag sorry okay here you have advanced settings right script meta tags and header if you add some kind of JavaScript it would run on every single page of your application right because this is general settings for your whole application whereas on a single page settings if you have a page HTML header obviously it'll only run for that page okay so let's say you have some kind of live chat feature on your website okay for us for nocodify.com for example we only have it on our landing page as well as any page that doesn't require a user to be logged in right so if they need help and they're not logged in they can go ahead and live chat us so we've added that JavaScript code to every single page HTML header but if we went ahead and added that JavaScript code to the, in the settings in the right here in the script meta tags in advanced settings that live chat kind of pop-up would be there for every single page okay so that's kind of the difference okay so that's really it for the design UI kind of portion the bubble editor I think we've gone through everything that you know bubble has to offer really there are a couple advanced features but you know they're advanced and this is a beginners workshop so we don't want to um, trouble you with those so let's get into the next part which would be app organization okay and this is a fairly quick topic so the first thing we want to cover is styles okay so let's drag in a button here okay let's remove the style with every and it's by default whenever you drag in a new visual element bubble will just kind of give it that primary style you can go ahead and click remove okay now let's say we're designing this button that's you know we're going to use it in many different areas of our application right so we want to go ahead and you know only have to build out this button the settings once and then you know next time when we add this button in we can just quickly use a style okay so let's say for the font we want Roboto 500 okay we want the text size to be 18 we want it bolded we want it italicized let's just write the text okay and the font we want red I don't know right it's an ugly button but it's just for showcase purposes okay let's say we're gonna use this button here everywhere not everywhere but many times within our application right so we'll give it a style right let's create a new style and say main button okay once we create this now we see the style of this button is the main button style and now we see that there are many there are less settings right because we're using a style if we want to edit the style we'd click edit style 
and we come to this area on the styles um, tab where we can edit that style right here on the right okay now let's see how useful using styles are right so now we'll add in another button and we see that now bubble gave it that default primary style we'll remove it okay and now it would take us what you know two three minutes to go ahead and use the same style as this one right to build it from the ground up or we can quickly go in style and click main button and then boom we got that red text with the italicized with the bolded and the font okay the one thing that doesn't carry over obviously is the actual text for the button right which would be annoying if when you created styles every single button would also carry the hello text right maybe for this button I wanted to say sign up okay so it's not going to carry over the actual text of the button it'll just carry over all of the look properties of it okay so that's styles okay so for anything that you're going to use many times within your application it's good to go ahead and use styles okay next we have reusable elements that we have written down but we covered it pretty much in depth okay so again just to stress out if you have many different forms right if you have let's say a header okay a header is a really good example right if you're on Airbnb again and you're browsing many different listings many different pages the header bar almost always looks the same the only difference with the header bar is if the user is logged in or if they're logged out so you can only you only have to build out two headers for your whole application one of them being the users logged out one of them being the users logged in if you'd like you can actually only build out one header where you have certain conditions to only show certain elements based on if the user is logged in or out so you could only maybe have to build one but if you'd like you can build two okay and now these would just be reusable elements so for example we'll go in this drop down we see bubble actually has a header reusable element okay fairly simple right but this is it right so now when we're building out certain pages all we have to do is scroll down and we can drag in this header okay we can give it an x coordinate of y or sorry of zero and a y uh, coordinate of zero and now it's at the top okay and there is our reusable element so now on another page we can quickly go ahead and bring in this header reusable element on another page okay so we don't have to keep constantly be keeping building new headers okay we just build it one time we make it a reusable element and now we can use it in many places of our application okay so that's reusable elements now the very last thing for app organization that we want to talk about are using pages versus using groups okay now this is a big thing for people that are new to bubble or even application de uh, development in general okay many people when they first start using bubble um, they'll go ahead and create a new page for everything okay for everything that's associated with anything right so for example a, you know someone can build in their bubble application a profile page would which would be the user's profile and then a separate settings page okay now let's go ahead and test this out right so we'll have a text here that will say profile okay and we'll add another text that says settings okay Now, for example, if we had two separate pages, okay, one being a profile page and one being a settings page, and I mean that right here, right, if we added a new page, one being profile, one being settings. Let's say that this profile was uh, text was a link, right, if the user clicked it, it would take them to the profile page. This would take most likely about three to four seconds to load, right, um, but and then also for the settings right if the user clicked settings it would take another three four seconds to load the settings page but if the you if you went ahead and build out your bubble application where you have groups okay you have a profile group okay and then you copy and pasted it and now you have a settings group okay so you have two groups one for 
and we'll rename this so it's easier to understand. If I could type group settings and then group profile. Okay. So if you have two different groups, okay, now you can just have it when the user clicks this profile link, you would show the profile group, okay? And if they clicked the settings link, it would hide maybe the profile group and show the settings group. Now Bubble is very good at handling workflows, okay? So this would happen within milliseconds, okay? Like instantaneously, really. It would hide profile, show settings, or, or uh, hide settings, show profile, okay? So you'll want to use groups as much as possible where it makes sense to, right? So you don't wanna have one page of your bubble application just with hundreds of hidden groups, okay? Because it doesn't make sense to, right? But if you have some kind of page, right, where it makes sense to have just groups that are hidden, and groups that are showing and then by clicking various buttons various links it would hide some and show others it's much faster okay and it's a better experience for the user than taking them to separate pages okay so that's just a word of note for app organization now lastly because of this bubble made it very nice that Having many groups within one page does not harm your the speed of your bubble application. And when I say this, I mean it doesn't harm the speed if your groups are hidden on page load. Okay? What this means is that when the page loads for the first time, it only loads the data that's shown on page load, that's visible on page load. So let's say that this group settings right here isn't you don't want it to show when the user first comes to this page so we would double click this group settings okay we'd scroll down and on this element is visible on page load we would click uncheck this checkbox okay so now when we load this page obviously group settings will not show on page load okay we'll need some workflow or, or some condition to show this group okay so by this group being hidden on page load, it's not making our performance any worse for our Bubble application, okay? It's making it better because now Bubble doesn't have to, let's say, load whatever is in this text field or load this button within this settings group, okay? Whatever is displayed in this text field or this button, which is gone for some reason, <laughs> button A, here we go, within the settings now. Um, whatever is within these elements will not load until this group settings is now visible, okay? So again, stressing on the fact that by having many groups on your page that are not visible on page load will not harm your the speed and performance of your application, okay? So that's it with application organization, and now we can move on to database design, okay? Bubble is a relational database, meaning that you want to go ahead and silo out all of the different data types that your application has, and you'll want to go ahead and relate things together, okay? That's really what a relational database is. If you don't know what it is, you can just go ahead on Google and YouTube, and you know, quickly take a 20, 30 minute lesson on it. We're, we don't wanna dive deep within this workshop on what it is. Um, so if you don't understand it, just go ahead and quickly do a little research on what relational databases are. Um, but for now, let's just go ahead and kind of show you how we would build out this Airbnb database design, okay? Now focusing on these custom data types, these are your big, big parts of your database, okay? So for example, by default, Bubble has a user data type, okay? Because your application will have users on it. Um, and then within each data type, there are data fields, okay? So for the, uh, the data type user, we see the fields that are provided, okay? By default, Bubble has email, modified date, and created date for the user, but we can always add more, okay? So let's say for every user of our application, 
right? For every object of the user data type, we want to collect the user's full name. Okay, now this field type, we have all of these different options, okay, that the, the data field can be. Now, obviously, for full name, it's just going to be a text field, okay? And we'll cover what this field is a list means in a couple moments, okay? And when we hit create, we see that the full name is now a text, okay? Next, we can add maybe date of birth, right? which would be a date, and we'll go ahead and create that. Now to showcase the field that, you know, this field is a list, okay, just as, a, as an example of when you would use this, let's say we want to track within our database log in attempts, okay? Every time the user logs into the application, we want to go ahead and log that within our database so we know how active our users are so this field type would be a date right we'd capture when they've the date and the time that they've logged into the application and we would say this field is a list right it's multiple entries okay we'll check this and press create so now we see that it's a list of dates okay so for this one data field we'll have an array of dates Okay, for the full name, right, for the text data field, that's full name, it's not a list, meaning that for every object, for every instance of a user, for every one user, there can, they can only have one full name associated with them. Okay, but if you make it a list of that data field, then you can have many of them. Okay, so for login attempts, we can have a whole big list of login attempts, hundreds, thousands of rows for login attempts for this one user. Okay, so that's basically how you'll build out the data fields for, you know, data types. Okay, so I, we believe that that's pretty self-explanatory to that point. Now for this uh, Airbnb type app, okay, let's think of some data types that would be relevant to an Airbnb app. Okay, the first one would be a listing, right? So, you know, Airbnb has hosts and users can be hosts. So, right, so we can go to the user, right, and we can say field name is host question mark, which would be yes or no. Okay, and then we can have is renter question mark, which would be a yes or a no. And that way, now we can know which user is a host and then which user is a renter okay and based on that we can build certain conditions within our application to show certain pages to users to show certain fields to users etc etc okay now on the listing we would probably have listing title right which would just be a text field okay we can have images which would be image and this is a list because they can have more than one image within a listing Okay, we have a creator, which is the user, which is good. So it links back to a user. And then we can have more things, right? We can say number of number of bedrooms, okay, which would be a number. We can have number of bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera, right? But you, you understand. So for every listing, we'll build out all of the data fields that are relevant to a Airbnb listing. Okay, now the way to link these two would be for every user, right? We can say listings offered. Okay, now we're relating it since it's a relational database, we have to relate it. So listings offered would, would mean that this user is a host and they are offering these listings, right? They are creating these listings. So the field type would be a listing. Okay, and it's a list. This field is a list, right? Because I believe on Airbnb, people can rent out more than one house, right? Because you have all of these businesses and, you know, these people that host many different houses, okay? So that's why for this data field, listings offered, if the person is a host, they can create listings and it, they would show up on listings offered, okay? Now, on the other hand, if it's a renter, right, you would have listings rented, 
right? Because you want to capture all of the listings that this one user rented. Okay, so again, it would be a listing and it would be a list of multiple entries because, you know, over the span of time on Airbnb, most likely you're going to rent more than one house on Airbnb. Okay, so that's how you go ahead and build out the listing. Okay, now let's add one more data type, okay, just so you kind of grasp the sense of relational databases, okay? And let's go ahead and say it's a rental period, something like that, okay? For here, you would have certain kind of data fields, right, for a rental period, okay? You would probably have rental uh, host, okay, which would be a user, right? So here we're capturing the host of this rental period. Okay, then you would have the rental renter, <laughs> right, which would be another user, okay? And then lastly, you would have a listing, okay, which would be one listing, because for one rental period, there can only be one listing, okay? And then you can also add the date, right, which would be a date range, date of rental, which would be a date range, right? We could say it's, you know, March 30th to April 3rd or something, right? That would be the date range for that rental. Okay? So there we go. There we've just linked up our database, right? We have a user data type with all of the appropriate data fields for the user. We created a listing that has all of the appropriate data fields for any given listing. And then we have a rental period, right, which is the way we connect it when a user, sorry, when a host and a renter, you know, come into contract and the renter is now renting that house from the host, we would probably create a data type that has that rental period where it connects that one listing, the one host, the one renter, and then it adds the date of rental. Okay, so I hope that now you understand a little bit about more about relational databases. Now let's go ahead and talk about some of these other tabs. So again, app privacy, we will talk about in our next part two workshop. But here in app data, this is where you'll see all of the data for your application. Okay, um, on the left side here, you'll see all of your data types. Okay, so for example, we would see all of our users here in this grid. We could see all of our date uh, rental periods, and then lastly, all of our listings. If we want to go ahead and add one real quick, we would just click New Entry, and we would go ahead and kind of add that database entry, right? And then we would see it pop, uh, pop up here. Or we can upload bulk amount of entries. We can modify, export, and bulk, right? So I would just play around with these. And we can create new views, right? If we want to see a uh, user view, right, with certain things, I only want to see uh, the listings that they rented or something, right? We can create new views, which would populate here on the left. Now, the biggest thing to take away from this workshop from for database design is that Bubble, with every application, has two, two different databases, okay? One version would be your development database, okay? While the other version would be your live database. Now, this is good because when you're building out your application, you are definitely going to want to test it, right? So by having two different versions, by you testing it, by you creating new users, um, creating example listings, example rental periods, just so you test out your application, in no way, shape, or form are you harming your live database, right? So these two database environments are completely separate, okay? You will not have to um, kind of manage each database together. They are managed completely separately. If you want to see your development database, you would be in the development environment. If you want to see your live database, you would click switch to live database, okay? So just keynote that, you know, this comes up often whenever new users of Bubble go ahead and deploy their current version to live. 
and let's say for example you have cities right because you want your users to pick the city of their listing let's say that right city name okay which would be text right so a smart thing to do here would be for you to add entries right city name new york okay next one atlanta atlanta okay Next one, um, Chicago, okay, et cetera, et cetera, right? Takes a while for them to load for some reason, um, but they're there in our database. So now, let's go ahead and click refresh. Hopefully, they'll show up. Right, so you would add in all of these cities okay and you can create a drop down see now they showed up you can go ahead and create a drop down which searches for this data type cities right and it would present all of the city names okay but here is that where the different versions of your of your database matters is the fact that you added these entries into your development into your development version but when you go ahead and deploy right deploy current version to live these entries do not carry over into your live database so you want to be wary of that if you ever create a data type strictly for giving your users drop down options or you know anything that's kind of static options for your users that you don't want them to mess up on right the way the the reason why i built out the city's data type is that now i would add a drop down for the user to select the city Right, because if I gave the user the option to type out Chicago, to type out Atlanta or New York, they might mess up, right? And now I would have different New Yorks in my database for other users to search on. Okay, so I, you want to limit limit the amount of uh, chances that your users might mess up on your application. Okay, so that's why it's good to build out kind of a static data type for cities or anything like that. Okay, but Again, one thing to note is that when I deploy this current version to live, these cities will not transfer over. So I would have to switch to my live database and go ahead and add new entries and add all of these entries again for my live database. Okay? Now, since I promised to go over this repeating group, okay, with this listings, let's go ahead and see how we can do it. Okay? So now for a repeating group, okay, imagine this website, this page being Airbnb, okay, and this is the repeating group that shows all of the independent listings, okay, to delete this one group here, okay, so the type of content would be a listing, okay, and the data source would be do a search for, okay, we're going to search for this listing, okay, the type would be a listing. Okay, so now this bubble is going to search for all listings and give that data source to this repeating group. Okay, but sometimes you'll want to limit the results, okay, because let's say for Airbnb, I searched for every single listing on Airbnb. That would probably crash my browser, okay, that would probably return, you know, over a million results, I'm guessing, in Airbnb, probably not good, okay? So you would want to add constraints right here, okay? So the first constraint being, okay, let's say I only want it where the created date, okay, is greater than current date time, okay, minus 7, meaning I just want to see the listings that have been created within the past seven days okay so now this repeating group would only search for listings that have been created within the last seven days okay that's just one example it probably doesn't really make sense for Airbnb but again it's just an example where you can add certain constraints into your repeating group so that it doesn't bring back every result Okay, now a great thing here is that, well, two great things really, is that there's a sort by, okay, so I can sort it by certain fields or by built-in kind of data fields. So if I want to sort it by listing title, okay, make it uh, ascend, descending, yeah, right? 
So now we're sorting it by the listing title, okay? I can sort it by the number of bathrooms, okay? So start with the highest, go with the lowest, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I can sort it by however I'd like, okay? And now here, ignore empty constraints. This is really good for, you know, not limiting your search when, when the constraints don't apply, okay? This maybe won't be a good reason, um, but let's say number of bathrooms equals seven, okay? If we check this ignore empty constraints, it means, okay, it means that when a house or a listing doesn't have bathrooms provided, then it will be shown, okay? Right, it just means that um, if this condition, if it's not relevant kind of to the search, to the listing, it'll still show. Okay, this is also good, meaning that if you have an input, okay, let's have an input here, input A, right? And now in our search for listings, this will make more clear sense for ignore empty constraints. Let's say add a new constraint, the listing title contains input A's value. Okay, meaning now we will have only show the listings that are relevant to this input, right? So if the user typed in um, Los Angeles house, it would only search for listings where the listing title contains Los Angeles house, okay? But now this ignore empty constraints means that if this input is empty, right? then it would still bring back all the listings, okay? So only if this input has a value associated with it, right? Like Los Angeles house, for example, then this constraint would take place. If this input field is empty, then it would just ignore this one constraint, okay? So that's this ignore empty constraints, okay? Now that we understand how to search for our specific data types, we want to learn how to build out this actual repeating group, right? A lot of people, when they first come and build, they think this is the end to it, but it's not, right? You'd want to still add in elements, visual elements. So let's go ahead and add in a text field. And you see when I add in an element, it adds it into every other row, right? And that makes sense. You only need to edit one of the rows and then everything else will look the same. Okay, so for this text A, we'll want to add in dynamic data and we'll say this current cells listing, right? Each listing will have its own row, right? Its own cell per se, right? So we'll say the current cells listing title. Okay, we'll add in an image that says dynamic image that says current cells listings, images, right and we'll probably say the first item right so now it's going to show the first image for that listing okay and this is how we build out a repeating group that's it okay we'll add in all of the elements into this first row and then all of the next rows will look the same way okay so now this will be listing a this would show listing b c and d Okay, and the last thing here for repeating groups is these layout style, okay? Right, so the vertical scrolling means that the user will have to be within this border area and scroll down for these rows to scroll up and down. If it was external vertical scrolling, it means that the user would have to be, you know, on the outside of the border, and they would just scroll down, and then more listings would pop up. Okay, this is how Facebook has it, this is how Instagram has it. So this external vertical scrolling is probably the way you want it because you see here rows four, it would only load four rows at first, right? Which is really great for performance. And then as the user scrolls down, it would start loading more. Okay, so it's definitely the way that you most likely wanna go with. Um, but again, vertical scrolling is also good in itself as well. You also have full list, and what this means is that it will literally load the full list of the listings, okay? Which is really bad if you have hundreds of rows. If you just have, you know, five to ten 
listings, it's fine to show the full list and it would just all load. Okay, but again, you want to think of performance. So if you have many, many listings, you do not want to show everything fully on page load. Next, you have fixed number of cells. Okay, so this means that you'll only show the amount of rows that you have. So here we have rows four, meaning we'll only bring back four listings. Okay, so this is good if you just want to show um, kind of like a certain amount, a fixed number, and then you'd probably have a button that says like show more or something that kind of loads a new repeating group or something like that. Okay, and lastly we have horizontal scrolling, which just means that now you would build out more columns, right? Now you have columns, and you would just go ahead, the user would scroll left and right. Okay, so that's it for repeating groups, guys. The last thing we want to touch upon are workflows, and we'll go through them pretty quickly because, you know, we can only do so much with workflows. In the end, you just have to play around with them, or you have to just really go ahead and ask us one-on-one -on -one questions about your workflows, okay? We can only show you a very small example, and then really it's how you want to go ahead and build out your own workflows, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about signing a user up into your application, okay? We will add an input that says email, okay? The content format would be e email. We would say password, right? Which would be type password. And we'd have a button that says sign up, okay? Now let's go ahead and start the workflows. And let's go ahead and group these, right? We'll select the three of them. We'll group these elements in a group and we'll label the group sign up, okay? Now let's go ahead and start that workflow. So we'll go to the button, right? When you're starting a workflow, you always wanna start that workflow from you know the action that's going to start it, right? Which would be clicking this button. So we'll start edit this workflow. And now the way workflows work in Bubble is that they're like, um, when this happens, do this, right? That's basically what the workflows are, right? So when bubble button sign up is clicked, do these actions, okay? And you can have hundreds of actions for one, for one occurrence, for one event, right? So let's go ahead and go here, and here you'll see all of the workflows that Bubble has, okay? Um, there are, you know, probably close to 50 of them or so off the shelf. And then if you go ahead and install more, right? Install more payment actions, install more email actions. These are just plugins, basically. If you install more, you can have potentially hundreds and hundreds of, you know, workflow items. But again, we want to focus on signing up the user. So an account will go to sign the user up. The email would be input emails value and then password would be input passwords value right you can require password confirmation you can send an email to confirm it you can remember the email etc etc but that's it guys we just built in one single workflow step we just built out a way to sign a user up to your bubble application that's pretty crazy right something like this would take a traditional web developer I mean, a good two, three days to build out, right? I mean, if they're really good, maybe a day or two, but we just did it in literally 10 seconds, okay? That is the power of no code, okay? Now the user has signed up to our application, okay? Um, next, we can go ahead and talk about login, right? If this now was a login button, okay, we would start edit this workflow when button login is clicked, now it wouldn't be sign the user up, right? It would be log the user in, right? And it would be the input emails value and the input passwords value, okay? Stay logged in if you want the application to remember that they are users and to remember them. It won't log them out in the future, okay? And let's take, let's build on more into this, okay? Let's say step one is log the user in. But step two, we want to change something in the database, right? Make changes to a thing, which would be the current user. Remember, we are, want to track their login attempts. So we would go ahead and add another field, and 
login attempts, we would add current date time. Okay, we just went ahead when the user logged in, we just added that date and time into the database into their login attempts. Pretty cool, right? Okay, let's add another workflow. Let's say after a user logs in, we want to email them. We want to be really annoying and spammy, and we want to email them saying thank you for logging in. So in the send email, we'll insert dynamic data. We would say the current user's email. Okay, we can fill out all this stuff pretty self-explanatory, and then in the in the body, we would say thanks for signing in. Right. Okay, so this is just an example, right? But with one event, right, when the button login is clicked, you can build out extremely complex workflows, right? We log the user in. We made a change to them by, made a change in the database to that specific user by adding in that login attempt. And then we also sent them an email, okay? So as you can see, you can build extremely complex workflows, right? Things that don't even make sense you could do. All right, element actions, you can then set the focus to the email, input email, right? Doesn't make sense in this specific example, but again, it's just an example. Okay, so that's really how you go ahead and you build out workflows, okay? Um, again, workflows are hard to teach. Um, in future workshops, we will be built, like, replicating applications and such, so you'll be able to to get a little more... Um, in depth with workflows, but again, if we're just kind of showing you workflows, it's a little hard to talk about all of them just because there's so many. Okay, now it, one other thing is that um, you can have workflows occur when buttons, when texts, when groups are clicked, or you can have them when conditions are true. Right, so we see here do when condition is true, do every five seconds, page is loaded. If the user is logged in or logged out, right? If an element is clicked, do this, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there are so many different workflows that you can do. A good one that you would always want to do is when the user is logged out, right? You probably want to navigate them to your index page, your landing page, right? Okay, this is for any sort of page in your application where... You can only have people on that page that are logged in, right, that have user accounts. So on page load, if the user is logged out, it would quickly send them to your landing page or any page that you'd like. Okay, so that's how you go ahead and build out workflows. Again, you want to build out all of your, your UI, your front end, go to the elements, and then start edit workflow. If it doesn't have anything to do with elements, you would go ahead just directly into the workflow, and then you would, you know, build out your workflows when certain conditions are true, right? So, for example, here would be only when, let's say, um, current page scrolling position is over 500 pixels. Okay, what this means is that when the user has scrolled down my page at least 500, or sorry, over 500 pixels, then we'll do something, right? Okay, we can show an element, right? We want to show the group sign up, or something, right? Anything. Okay, so that's how you go ahead and build out some other workflows. Okay, guys, so thank you for, you know, watching and viewing this um, part one of the Bubble Beginners Workshop presented by NoCodify. Um, we will be uploading part two yeah, probably sometime tomorrow or today. Um, and again, if you enjoyed this video, if you're interested in in, in web development and no code development, especially Bubble, right? Um, feel free to check out our site, nocodify.com. We have many things that are free, okay? Um, but if you do want more help, check out our one-on-one -on -one sessions. Check out our business builder. And again, just because you're watching this workshop, we are offering 50% off of our lifetime plan. Um, we're constantly adding in new features, new tutorials. So please check us out at nocodify.com. Okay, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And I really hope that you just check out Bubble and you really try it. Thank you guys.